morning. Good morning to everyone joining us online. Welcome to this service of worship for this Sunday, February 6th. I'm glad that you're all joining with us. Today is a communion Sunday. We'll also celebrate a baptism today. So it's a very special day in the life of the church. If you're at home, um, I would encourage you to go ahead and grab a few things to celebrate communion, uh, perhaps a candle to set apart this time as sacred and light that candle to, to create that worship atmosphere. And then uh, get something to represent the elements, uh, the bread and the cup. So uh, if you have wine and juice, you can use those. If you have orange juice and coffee, you can use that. Jesus turned ordinary things into extraordinary things. So something to represent the bread and something to represent the cup. And then I hope all of you gathered here grabbed one of your communion cups. We're not passing the, the um, communion trays or doing intention. We have those little cups um, and they're right in the entryway. So if you didn't get one, uh, go ahead and, and grab one of those for communion. Um, then you'll notice in the bulletin, one little thing is we have, uh, if you're using the hymnal, the hymn is 542 instead of 541. It's the same hymn, different tune. Uh, so just note that, but it'll be correct up on the, up on the slides um, there. Then we have a, a couple of other church announcements. We have the Super Bowl Sunday appetizers that are going on sale. Uh, we would like to get all the pre-orders in for those appetizers by tomorrow. Uh, the appetizers are little tacos, Swedish meatballs, and garlic breadsticks. They are delicious. They've been uh, doing trial runs with them. And so for Bible study, we got to be the guinea pigs. Um, and so we, we made a couple recommendations and they took those garlic breadsticks and they, they basted them with a butter and Parmesan on top and they're good. They're very good. Um, so please uh, get your orders in for those. You can do that on the website or you can call. And then, um, we have an implicit bias experience sign up and Sarah, do you want to say anything more about that? Sure. Here comes Sarah. Maybe you're making Leo jump. So we're offering an implicit bias uh, kind of training. And this comes out of our uh, cast study book group. And it's going to be February 20th and 27th, um, both times. So we'll do like half of it the first Sunday and then the second half the next Sunday. And so you all are welcome to sign up or call Mariah in the office to join or just show up that day. And it should be a really good way to learn more about ourselves and more about how we interact with other people. Thank you. Okay. I believe those are all of the announcements that I have today. Is, is there anything else for the good of the body? All right. Let us center our hearts and minds then to worship God. Please stand as you are able for the call to worship. Come along with me as a sojourner in faith. Bring along a sense of expectancy, a vision of high hopes, a glimpse of future possibility, a vivid imagination, for God's creation is not done. 
we are called to pioneer a new future with God. As we venture forward, we leave behind our desires for a no-risk life, worldly accumulations, and certainty. Let us travel light in the spirit of faith and expectation toward the God of our hopes and dreams. Come along together as sojourners in faith, knowing that God goes with us and God is here now. It is in our confession where we realize our desire for God and our hope for God's mercy. It is in admitting the truth of our lives that we take the first step toward wholeness and healing. So let us make our confession together. Please join me in a prayer of forgiveness. God of all the saints, God of all the sinners, hear our prayer. We long to be saint-like, holy, good, patient, loving, but we end up feeling more like sinners, moral failures, selfish, mean. Perhaps you see us simply as human, as beloved and flawed, failing and succeeding, but trying. In all of this, forgive the wrong that we have done and bless the good we have accomplished. Keep on loving us and helping us and molding us more and more into the image of Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Let us continue to pray in silence. Friends, hear this good news. The love of God is beyond measure, and you are included in that love. Know that you are forgiven and thus freed to love and serve. We give thanks that through Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and being made whole so that we might shine God's light, share God's love, and be shaped as God's people. Amen.
Please join me in the prayer of illumination. Holy God, may the soil of our hearts be fertile ground in which your word may take root. Speak to us today the word we need to hear, whether it is a word of comfort or for conviction, courage or correction. Plant it deep within us and bring it to fruition. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The scripture lesson is from Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 14. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. Not that I am referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. In any case, it was kind of you to share my distress. The words of the Lord. Savior 
you, Sarah. Our gospel lesson for today comes from Matthew chapter 12, verses 9 through 14. Jesus left that place, and he entered their synagogue. A man was there with a withered hand, and they asked him, Is it lawful to cure on the Sabbath? They asked him this so that they might accuse him. He said to them, Suppose one of you has only one sheep, and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath. Will you not lay hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a human being than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and it was restored as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him. They made plans on how to destroy him. The words of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Most holy God, giver of wisdom and knowledge, as we gather this day to hear more about your gift of resilience in our lives, we ask that you open our hearts and minds to hear ways that we can work to persevere, to adapt, to overcome, and to have hope, even in the worst of situations. Be with us as we hear your words proclaimed today. In Christ's name, amen. Some proud grandparents traveled to see their recent college graduate who had earned a big prestigious job in a large city. They flew in, they arrived, and they said, you pick the restaurant. They went to the place of his choosing, and it was this really nice setting. And they sat down, and immediately the grandson pulled out his phone. And the grandmother and grandfather shared that look. And he caught it. And he said, no, 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 the menu's online. It's, it's on your phone. And they said, what? And, and he said, look, look. He said, just scan the QR code there on the corner of the table and you can get the menu online. And the grandfather said, scan the what with the who? And he said, can we just have a menu? And the grandson said, well, they're, they're a dollar. He was like, what? Where's our waitress? And they said, oh, well, they don't have wait staff. You just order online. And there's the drink station over there. You can't, you can't drink enough free refills of Diet Coke to cover the overhead for having a whole wait staff. And he's like, oh, you can get, you can get your wine. You can just order that online from the bar. And the, the server will just bring it to you. And the grandmother was already looking at the menu and said, oh, honey, don't worry about it. They have tofu steak. You love steak. Change is the only constant, said some wise Greek philosopher. We live in a modern age of rapid technological and informational change, and it can be downright disorienting. And now we can't even get menus at some restaurants. The author of Weathering the Storm, Reverend Dr. Tracy Murmuska, shares her insights from years of studies about resilience. She says change, whether it's personal change, technological change, life changes, she says change has the ability to cause emotional, spiritual, and even physical suffering. In the midst of experiencing change, we are faced with uncertainty, insecurity, and we have to develop new understandings of ourselves and our circumstances. Change requires the characteristic of resilience. One of the characteristics of resilience is pliability, the ability to bend without breaking. 
Lao Tzu says, whatever is flexible and flowing tends to grow. Whatever is rigid and blocked will atrophy and die. If we don't want to atrophy and die, if we want to be resilient as in being able to be happy, even in the worst of circumstances, even after something bad happens, then we need to cultivate our pliability. And pliability is this, a willingness to acknowledge the new realities we face and to mindfully and intentionally live into those new realities, managing anxiety, embracing hope, and exploring possibilities. Resilient people, resilient nations, resilient organizations, resilient churches learn to assess, accept, and adapt. The alternative is to get stuck. How do you get a car unstuck if it is in the mud? What do you do? First, you assess the situation, right? And you know when that assessment starts because you have that sinking feeling when the tires start to spin and you're not going anywhere. Then you have to accept it, right? You assess, I'm stuck. And then you have to accept it. I have to get out in the mud and figure out how to get unstuck. And you have to adapt. You have to explore what you're going to do. And the only way to get unstuck, whether it's out of the mud in your car or in life, as a nation, as a church, as a person, the only way to get unstuck is to move. You have to move. If you sit still, nothing will happen. We can get stuck in all kinds of ways. Personally, we can get stuck in stages of grief, like anger or depression, denial. Nations can get stuck in how they think about others in the world. Churches can get stuck in stages of faith with rigid dogma or doing things as they've always been done. Organizations and businesses can get stuck, focusing on just how they've always done things or what's their bottom line, neglecting to explore new innovations because they're getting in enough money right now. There's a story about the CEO of Blockbuster. And a young man came to him and said, I'd like to take your stores online. This was in 2000. And the CEO of Blockbuster said, what do you mean? I have thousands of stores and millions of customers all around the country, all around the globe. That young man was the CEO of Netflix. In 2020, Netflix had a $16.8 billion revenue Blockbuster went bankrupt in 2010. We have to think and explore and not just get focused on one thing. In a TED Talk on adaptability, angel investor Natalie Frado says that adaptability is not fixed. And we heard that in our study about resilience. Adaptability. One of the characteristics of resilience is not something that's fixed. It can be cultivated. It can be shaped. We all have the ability to improve, to improve our capacity to be pliable. Here's two pieces of her advice on how we can boost our adaptability. She says, instead of learning, try unlearning. Here's the example she gives. Let's say you're learning to ski. You learn first to do that little pizza pie shape, right? And this is how you stop. You have to make that little pie shape to stop yourself on the bunny hill. But if you want to become a good skier, at some time, you have to unlearn that. And you have to learn how to stop doing your little slides and pivots. 
right? And if you don't unlearn that behavior, you're not going to progress any farther in your skiing adventures. Jesus taught about unlearning in our scripture today. He taught about unlearning when it came to laws about the Sabbath. Now, the laws of the Sabbath were given out of love for God's people. God wanted us to have a rest. The Sabbath day was very important. But Jesus was stuck between being pliable about the laws of the Sabbath and not compromising on his conviction of compassion and love. He had to bend, but not break. The Pharisees try to trap him. They try to trap him saying, this law is rigid, it can't be broken. And Jesus said, is it, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? If you had a sheep that fell in a ditch, wouldn't you go get it? And he said to the man, stick out your hand. And he healed it. Jesus faced compassion versus the law. And common sense said, those things don't always work together. And so he had to learn to be pliable. He had to apply the characteristic of resilience. He had to bend, but not break. As a church, as people of faith, we are still learning how to unlearn what it means to practice biblical teachings and grace. We could unlearn a lot of things as a nation as well. We have become more rigid about people who view the world differently. We lack compassion and empathy and sympathy for those who seem to hold a different worldview. One of the ways to overcome that is to understand that almost everyone who is concerned in some way about the world comes from a place of caring. And if we can see with sympathy and empathy that people care, that what they're talking about and why they're so passionate about it is because they care, then we can begin to be more pliable. We can bend, but not break. Being pliable, adapting, doesn't mean that we're compromising. It means that we're resetting goals. And resetting goals is how you succeed in life. It's how you succeed in business. It's how you succeed in relationships, changing expectations, but not compromising on your underlying principles. That's how you become pliable. Frado admits that it, it is hard to unlearn certain skills that have become ingrained. One of my favorite stories about my grandfather uh, that my granny would tell uh, was that they went to a hotel. And in the middle of the night, my grandfather got up, got out of the bed, and went towards where he thought the bathroom was. And my granny said, that's the closet. Habits are hard to break. Unlearning things is hard to do. A person, though, can unlearn by taking a new vantage point, by looking at things from a different perspective. This is exploring. Exploring situations from new angles can be helpful with big life changes like retirement, or divorce, loss of a loved one, or even a global pandemic. This need to explore is an attribute that's closely tied with our ability to adapt and to be pliable. It's how you find ways of breaking ingrained habits. So one couple I knew got married in the middle of the pandemic. They were an older couple, second marriage. Both of their spouses had, had died from their previous marriages and they had both recently retired. And so here they were honeymooning together in a farmhouse out in the country, both recently retired, both avid readers and absolutely going stir crazy with each other. So they decided to explore. They set out on a quest 
to find the best pie in Iowa. And so they planned road trips on weekends where they would go out and they would travel across the state and they would go and get a piece of pie to go. They'd order their dinner and the pie to go, and then they'd go find one of the nearby parks and sit down and have their pie. Exploring helped them to adapt to the pandemic and to become more resilient in their relationship. They were literally worried about whether their marriage could handle being stuck together in a farmhouse as weeks turn into months and months turn into years with that pandemic. So they adapted. But what if you're really stuck? What if you were stuck in the muckiest mud of all, right? What if you're so stuck that you can't move? that you, you've gotten out of the car, you've assessed the situation, and there's nothing you can do. We think about the Apostle Paul from our epistle lesson today in his letter to the Philippians. Paul was writing that letter while he was in prison. He was literally in chains. He was stuck. He couldn't move. But he had other forms of resilience. We've talked about a couple of these. He had positivity. He said it could have been worse, right? That's the inverse of gratitude. It could always be worse because Paul, for Paul, it had been worse. Remember when he was drowning off a shipwreck, right? He had been in prison before and flogged before. And he said, oh, it could always be worse, right? That's, that's backwards positivity, right? And, and it would be worse again for Paul. And he had also cultivated these deep relationships with other people. That's one of the characteristics of resilient people. They have these deep relationships. And so he counts his blessings instead of his woes. He corresponds with his friends. He gives thanks. And he becomes mentally unstuck, even though he was bound by chains. He adapted to a no-win situation. There's a term from Star Trek for a no-win situation. It's called the Kaboyashi Maru. The Kaboyashi Maru. It's an exercise in the Starfleet Academy to test the character of cadets in a no-win scenario. So the simulation would go something like this. You have to rescue a civilian spaceship, the Karurashi Maru, which is damaged and stranded in Klingon territory. And the cadet being evaluated must decide whether to enter in to that territory and risk losing his life, the ship, and the life of the crew, or to leave the Kabayashi Maru, to certain destruction. If the cadet in the simulation chooses to attempt a rescue, an unsurmountable enemy force attacks their vessel and everyone is destroyed. If they choose not to do anything, everyone on the Kabayashi Maru dies. Captain James T. Kirk, became the only candidate to defeat the Kabarashi Maru. Here's how he did it. He said, I don't believe in no-win situations. So he snuck into the academy and he reprogrammed the simulation to make it possible to rescue the stranded ship. Some of the instructors said, that's cheating, that's cheating. And the director said, no, he beat the game. And isn't that the good news of Jesus Christ? A strongest sense of resilience comes from our faith that there is no such thing as a no-win situation. Our hope above all hope is that Christ is victorious over all things. 
we can access, accept, and adapt to any situation because Jesus changes the rules of the game. We always end up victorious, even if we were stuck in chains. We have hope. So if you were stuck, if you were stuck beyond the ability to adapt by unlearning or creating new habits and new ways of thinking, if you can't explore new ways to find happiness, if accessing and acceptance seem more like you're just spinning the wheels of life in the mud, have hope. We do not believe in no-win scenarios. May God give you the strength of Christ's resilience for us. Amen. family and witnesses for Charlotte's baptism, please come forward. So on behalf of the session, I present to you uh, Charlotte Grimmick, daughter of Carson and Hope Grimmick, to receive the sacrament of baptism. In baptism, we give thanks for the waters of life. We remember how in the beginning of creation, God created the heavens and the earth, the stars and the sky, the ground and the land, and the spirit of all life hovered over the waters of creation. We remember how in the time of our ancestors, that they were trapped in slavery in Egypt, and they crossed the waters of the great sea. The waters parted, and they found freedom. We remember how when the world had fallen into chaos, the waters of the flood came and washed everything over and made all things new, and we had a new beginning. Christ before he set out on his earthly ministry, came through the waters of the Jordan, dying to himself, being cleansed, renewed, and he went to serve and love others. We give thanks for these waters of life.
when we baptize. We make a proclamation about who God is and who we are as God's children. We baptize infants because that symbolizes that God loves us even before we could respond to God's love. The psalmist says that even while we were being knit together in our mother's womb, God knew us and God loved us. So through these waters of baptism, we make a proclamation that Charlotte belongs to God, is a child of God, and will always be loved. We also make promises to raise her and nurture her in the faith. Understanding the symbolism of baptism and the waters of life that it represents. Do you desire that Charlotte be baptized? If you do, say we do. Relying on God's grace, do you promise to live the Christian faith, to teach that faith to Charlotte, to be an example for her and to pray with and for her so that she may grow in her knowledge and love of God? If you do, say we do. And to all of you gathered here this day, do you as members of the Church of Jesus Christ promise to guide and nurture Charlotte and Carson and hope by word and deed with love and prayer, encouraging Charlotte and her parents to know and follow Christ and to be faithful members of Christ Church? If you do, say, we do. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the way of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? If you do, say, we do. And do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting his grace and love? If you do, say, we do. We do. And will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? If you will, say, we will. We will. And will you do your best to teach the way of Jesus to Charlotte? and allow your larger church family to help raise her in the faith. If you will, say we will. If you would, please join with me in the affirmation of faith. With the whole church, let us confess our faith. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? And do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body. Most holy God, pour out your spirit upon these waters so that they may become a symbol for us of new life, of dying to ourselves and living for the way of Christ, and that they may be symbols of your claim on Charlotte's life as your child, beloved, and cared for. In Christ's name, amen. Miss Charlotte, are you ready to be baptized? You little <laughs> sweetness. But I know. Hi. Miss Charlotte, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Most holy God, we give you thanks for the life of Charlotte. We pray for her growth and her development. May she not be so caught up in material things like designer jeans and hairstyles, but have a heart of love and compassion. May she be humble and good, showing forth the love of Christ in all things. In Christ's name, amen. Friends.
I present to you one of our newest members of Christ Church, Miss Charlotte. Say welcome. She's so good. <laughs> so good. Yeah? Look, not a granny and grandpa over there. Uh, look at these people. That's your bigger family. More grannies and grandpas everywhere. Huh? Very good. And now we have a gift for you and for Charlotte from the Presbyterian women. Miss Pat, there you are. Baptism promises, and it, um, it says for Charlotte Rose Remick, baptized February 6, 2022, from the First Presbyterian Church, Mount Pleasant, Iowa, signed by Reverend Trey Hayes. It was going to be read to Charlotte at night. And then from the Presbyterian women, we would like to present Charlotte with a uh, fork and spoon. Congratulations. There you go, Charlotte. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. Yeah. So I, I told the family a, a story about baptism. It's one of my favorite baptism stories. And there was a, a, a family who had their child baptized in Texas. And when they um, uh, had the child baptized, there were some people just like you gathered to witness the baptism that day, just like all of you worshiping with us at home. Um, and then the, the little girl grew up and she left Texas and she went to, to school way out in the Midwest. And she was coming home one year for Christmas, driving through Kansas and her car broke down and the parents didn't know what they were going to do. Um, and so they started making some phone calls and someone said, hey, do you remember so-and-so who used to go to our church? They live in Kansas. And so they called this family that was in church on the day their daughter was baptized, who had moved to Kansas 10 years before. They hadn't talked to him in years. And they told them what had happened. Their daughter broke down and could you go get her? And they did, All right? That's the promises we make as a family of Christ to be there for Charlotte. So may it be so. We give thanks to God for making a bigger family through the church. Let us celebrate with sharing communion. This is the table of God for all the people of God. When the people were hungry, coming from all places to see Jesus, and there were 5,000 gathered there, there wasn't a quiz. There wasn't an exam on beliefs. There wasn't any question. They were hungry, and Jesus had compassion on them. He would turn no one away who was seeking to be fed spiritually, emotionally, physically. All are welcome to the table of Christ. Let us pray. Most holy God, we give you thanks for the gift of communion, that this bread and this cup represent a feast where all people will one day be fed, where all will be welcomed in peace. We give thanks that this feast reminds us of all who have come before us, our ancestors in the faith, our parents, our grandparents, our Sunday school teachers, all those who have broken bread together are gathered at this heavenly table and we will be gathered with them again too. So we give you thanks for all that this table represents. We pray for our world that we may have hearts to create bigger tables, that we may see that all people are a child of God, and that we may practice the way of Christ in our world. We pray for our nation as we continue to struggle with so many divisions, with not understanding each other, 
that we may have a heart of empathy and sympathy, that we may see that people care, and may we be pliable. May we be able to bend but not break as we reach to adapt and overcome. We pray especially this day, O oh Lord, for people in our community, for those on hospice care, for those who are suffering uh, with their families, with traumas, for those who experience ongoing grief, for those who know deep joy. We give you thanks for those things. And we lift up the people that we care about who need your extra love and care in the presence of your Holy Spirit. May it be felt amongst them. And if we can be of help, O oh Lord, send us to be your hands and feet. We pray all of these things in Christ's name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and he poured it out and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. It is my blood shed for the forgiveness of all sin. Drink this in remembrance of me. Friends, it is truly a mystery that Christ's body broken can make us whole and that his blood spilled can fill us up with the good things of the Holy Spirit. Friends, the feast of God for the people of God.
Friends, go for the, oh, there's a little pop there. Thanks, sorry about that. Friends, go from this place and hold on to what is good. Return no person evil for evil, but strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak, help the suffering. Honor all people, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And love yourself and love God, for that is Christ's greatest commandment. Go and do these things, sharing the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. Amen.